So that's a wrap. Our latest episode, a brilliant deep dive into the future of work in a net zero world with Professor Linda Gratton marks the end of season one here at Conversations on Climate. 20 incredible guests and over a million viewers around the world and all in just 10 months. Nice. Don't worry, we'll be back with season two very soon and we've got a fantastic episode to kick us off. Francois Ortago Magne, the Dean of London Business School, will be talking to us about the arts of piloting a world leading institution through the sustainability transformation. But today, between one season ending and another about to begin, we have a moment to pause and look back and to reflect. Since we started Conversations on Climate, I've learned more about this subject than I could have imagined. Today, I want to share the essence of that learning with you so far. Little did I realize what a challenge that would be. Distilling the wisdom from this season into a short message felt like writing crib notes for war and peace. But if working in climate has taught me anything, it's how to persevere in the face of a challenge. It's that community that we're building that inspires me to keep on going. So here's my review of the first season of Conversations on Climate, dedicated to everyone who's joined us as a viewer or listener along the way. I hope you enjoy. To introduce the overarching theme of this season, I'm going to start with someone I didn't even interview, but I wish I had. And if I had have reached out, I would have been 200 years too late. I'm talking about the father of environmentalism himself, Alexander von Humboldt. If you hadn't heard of him, he was an incredible human. A scientist, a romantic, a student of business and a philosopher a man of letters, a map maker and explorer of the world. There was almost no limit to his curiosity, nor his talent for picking up new skills and disciplines along the way. If I were able to talk to him, I would ask him about two things in particular. First is how we realised that climate change could be a result of human impact upon the environment while travelling across South America in the early 1800s, years before we even had a concept of the greenhouse effect. It's the true origin story of Western climate science. Second is his masterwork Cosmos, in which he combines his many disciplines to describe the world itself as a single, interrelated system, a truly ecological way of saying. Here's the ultimate lesson I've drawn from our season one. That climate change is a problem that touches every discipline, every human endeavour. Therefore, there can be no single solution to the climate challenge. We cannot even understand it properly if we only look through one lens and von Humboldt only beat me to that realisation by a couple of centuries. If we do take a political position on this podcast, it's in the widest sense. It's this. Humanity cannot afford to take a narrow approach to climate change, as we've done with so many other problems in the past. It's not about finding that one policy or product or idea that will save the world and then converting everyone else to your new god. That may be a good description of our divided culture today, but it just won't work, and here's why. Let's take a single solution position as an example. Some people believe that climate is a problem for the energy industry to solve. That's about decarbonisation and shifting everything to 100% renewables and getting the sector behind that push. Do that, emissions fall to zero and the problem is solved. And they're right. Others see it as an issue of transparency. It's difficult to trust the energy industry to make the transition given their history of lobbying and fundamental climate denial. What will solve climate change is the truth-telling and accountability for power. And they're right too. Some others think that moral pressure won't work. We have no chance of changing these industries without regulating and properly policing. We need to get the economics right first. Which sounds good to me. Yet others say that will never happen without a broader political movement and to mobilise the voter. A true environmental politics built on the reality of our shared future. But that'll never happen because humans are fundamentally irrational. Instead, we should understand the psychology of behavioural change and use that to nudge consumers to make sustainable choices. But change in behaviour is difficult. Wouldn't it be easier to look to innovate and create new sustainable technologies so that consumers never need to struggle against their own self-interest? But what product is truly sustainable on a finite planet? Don't we need to confront steady-state economics and degrowth to rethink the very principles of the market itself? And what about all of the other issues we face, from biodiversity and water to racism and inequality? Do we really think we can tackle one thing without addressing all the rest? I could go on for a very long time because this is the reality of climate change. It has many different solutions as it has descriptions of the problem. Your job is to be... These are all conversations we've had at some point across season one. You know, and that's the reason I joined... All these are positions that are at least somewhat correct. Step away 
and none of them holds the whole truth. In line with the season one. It's a chorus, not a song. You'd need to be a genius, a true polymath, to understand all of the facets of climate change at once. But today, the scale of human knowledge and the human impact on the world is too vast to be constrained within just one person. No singular individual has all the answers to climate. No superhero is coming to save us. And that's okay. We can't just have the same conversation over and over. No one has all the answers. Instead, I see the podcast itself as embodying the spirits of Von Humboldt. It seeks solutions by gathering a chorus of voices rather than relying upon a single gifted soloist. In just 20 episodes, we have begun to gather that chorus. Take energy. On the one hand, we've had oil sector voices like Julio Jopaz talking about the transition going on amongst the oil majors. So that has been my journey. It has been quite interesting. On the other hand, we had Janis Comates taking us through the renewables investing landscape and Ricardo Giubidoli on growing algae for carbon capture in the deserts of Morocco. Or consider technology. We've gone to the next level deep dive clean tech with Ramos Nasser on big data, Bidiku Kumar on retrofilling the metropolis of Hong Kong, and Triap building the next generation startup for carbon free offsetting. Balancing out this focus on hardware and software, we were also talking about wetware, the psychology of the human mind. From Dan Cable extolling the virtues of finding your purpose, to Kathleen O'Connor on hacking the skills for climate negotiation, to Zoe Chance on using your influence as a climate superpower. These have been fascinating discussions. Across business and finance, we've heard from ESG investors at some of the biggest institutions in the world. Tara Schmitz at Lloyds Banking Group and Catherine DeConnick-Lopez at Invesco. As well as the young climate VC setting up on his own at the other end of the spectrum with Amory Pulden from D2 Capital. From the political perspective, we've had Paul Baer extolling the importance of government relations, former Treasury Mandarin Sir Andrew Linkerman on judgment and decision making at the national level, Sam Baker, who gave up a glittering career to become a grassroots activist and walked the cop in the process. Last but not least, we've spoken to some of the greatest minds across the fields of economics and management, and they offered a whole world of varied and sometimes conflicting ideas from academia. Michael Jacobides explained why the markets of tomorrow will look like ecosystems. JP Benoit gave us the game theory of climate change and why it might just be a rational accident. Julian Birkenshaw and Linda Grattan, two of the foremost management thinkers in the world, gave us their views on leadership in times of disruption, including passionate defences of the corporation. Then we had Ayana Soanu to talk greenwashing, profit versus purpose, and why climate was bringing the future of the firm and capitalism itself into question. What I find remarkable about the gathering of all these voices together is how, as well as offering different solutions to climate change, they see different questions in it too. For so much threat, what do we need to do to survive? For others, an opportunity. How can I build to thrive? Others ask, what is the moral imperative here? How can I best convince others? Where is the wealth creation opportunity? What can nature teach us about the solution? We need to ask all these questions and then have all these conversations. We'll continue to need the inventors, the scientists, the politicians, and the journalists. We'll need the academics and the entrepreneurs and the artists and the activists. We need the experience of old and the vision of the young. We need the perspectives of the global north and the south too, the modern and the traditional. We need to hear from the mind, the heart and the hand. In this way, Conversations on Climate is about building an ecosystem of ideas, an ecology of voices. So far we have bloomed where we were planted, our natural home across business and academia but we'd love to widen our field further, to speak to school strikers and ministers and indigenous activists alike. David, Greta, Christina, Al, if you're watching, we'd love to have you on. As for season two, we've already got some incredible topics lined up. We'll be tackling fatbergs and carbon pricing, shareholder activism and stakeholder capitalism, moral marketing and ethical m and If you enjoyed season one, you're gonna love what comes next. I can't wait to share it with you all. Thanks once again for joining us on the journey so far. And please add your voice to our chorus by subscribing, commenting, or sending me a message. It really makes a difference. If there's one thing I've learned, is that we'll make it together or not at all. So join in. Let's make it a proper conversation. Mm -hmm.